I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today and welcome everyone. This is a wonderful opportunity for the city of Shelbyville to recognize the Rab family. We've done so much for our community and in the country, well renowned, and uh, we're very blessed to have had them as a part of our history and culture in this community. Here in a, a little bit later on, you're going to hear people talk about the Rab family and uh, Mr. Christopher Rabb's here also, the grandson of, of Dr. Rabb, the first Dr. Rabb. He's going to uh, talk about uh, the family, but uh, there's a lot of people here that knew the Rabb family. I personally didn't. I was a small child back then, but one person I would like to talk about is Maureen Ashby. Where's Maureen Ashby? There she is. Maureen has the distinction of being the first female baby delivered by Dr. Ray. And, and that's why her name is Maureen, as close to Maurice as you could get. But anyway, I want to thank the Senator also for coming out today and taking time out of his busy schedule. Judge Rothenberger and Mike Miller, this is Mike's property, but Mike and I were talking not too long ago about, about a lot of history that we have in this community. Not only the Rab family, we had the Saffel's funeral home right over there. The old city jail is right there. Of course, we're in the older part of town. We've got Harry Truman's grandparents lived here in the community. Of course, we all know about the Boones and their contribution to our community. Bob Matthews, Alan's father, who's here today, is our attorney general. Uh, Mike lived actually on the Bayless farm, which a lot of us knew as the Bayless farm, but it's actually a painted stone farm where Squire Boone had his first fort. So I'm not, I'm not going to sit up here too long because it's a very hot day, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Judge Rothenberger, and he's going to have a few words for the crowd also. But again, I want to thank everybody for coming out. This is a wonderful event for the city of Shelbyville. I want to thank uh, Mr. Christopher Rabb for coming so far to be here today also. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You know, in 2004, there was a made-for-movie television that was released, a uh, film was released, it was called Something the Lord Made. It was released, the story, story uh, line tells of an African-American named Vivian Thomas, who was hired originally as an assistant to a renowned surgeon at that time, and together they became innovators of a surgical procedure that corrected the effects of a congenital heart disease known as Blue Baby Syndrome. But this simple arrangement did not come easily. For you see, blacks were assigned non-skilled jobs and positions, not surgical techs, or surgeons at that time. But as the movie progresses, not only are the medical procedures advanced, but race relations too. Thomas goes on with his partners to instruct others at Johns Hopkins University, breaking all types of barriers present during that age. The movie came about as a result of an interview in 1989 in the magazine Washingtonian, when a writer told the story in relationship of Thomas and Dr. Blaylock. Widespread interest occurred, spurring the development of the film. Today, we could very easily write the script for something the Lord made too. Dr. Maurice Rabb Sr. and Jr. faced similar circumstances. Both Dr. Rabbs pushed through any and all race relations to provide high quality medical care and became pioneers in their selected specialty fields that it will be mentioned in more detail later on. Numerous medical articles have been written over the course of the years describing and detailing the efforts and successes of these two doctors that we can proudly say started their careers in Shelbyville at this very spot. For that many lives that have been saved to standing up against injustice in society, we thank you to the Rab family for these two medical guardians, and we thank you to the individuals responsible for keeping their memory and accomplishments alive to provide encouragement to other aspiring African-American medical professionals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I'm Mike Miller, Betsy, my wife. 
Uh, want to thank the mayor, the judge, uh, our speakers today. Uh, Santa Jones will be representing the uh, Historic Commission, and then Senator Rand Paul, an ophthalmologist, will be speaking. Uh, then our special guest, Chris Rabb, who came from Philadelphia by Alabama and has a short window to speak, so we're going to move forward. And uh, then Reverend Marshall will close us with a uh, testimony and a short prayer. Uh, Betsy and I bought this property in 1997 and actually knew nothing about what we had. Nothing. I think we were just a little bit of a generation removed from uh, the Rabb family. And one day, years actually we owned it, I was talking with uh, Reverend Marshall out here, and uh, Rev said, Mike, I have my leg cast in this building. I said, Rev. You had a broken leg and you had it set and cast in a barber shop? He said, no, 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 this was a doctor's office in their home. And he mentioned and told me a little bit about the Rabb family and said that he had lost some contact with the Rabb family over the years. And that just piqued my interest. So I got a hold of Miss Betty Matthews, who's down here with her son, Alan, that was on our city council for 10 years. And she's our number one historian and Miss Matthews got information on the house to me and said, get a hold of Duane Puckett, who Duane's down here. She, for our guests, she was an editor of our paper. And uh, Duane had started a lot of information on the Rabb family. So I started looking at that and reading, and I was just fascinated at what they had accomplished, and not just being nationally known, but globally known for what Dr. Rabb Jr had accomplished, and Jewel as an educator, and uh, Dr. Rabb Sr. as a physician. Well, I, we knew that we had to do something. We just couldn't sit on this information. Even though many of you, are, I'm hearing so many stories, you knew the Rabs. I just happened, I didn't. And uh, so we went to the Historic Commission, and they invited us to be a part of the tapestry event, which was really, really a good event held in uh, February, and wanted to do a display. Well, obviously we couldn't pick up the house and put it in the gym, so we had a picture of the house, handouts about the Rab family, they were all gone, and we thought up the idea of having a plaque uh, at the display, and of course put it on the house at appropriate time. And uh, I think Mitchell Payne, I don't know if Mitchell's here, he emceed that event that day. So then it got to the point where we wanted to uh, put the plaque on the building. I had to go to Triple S Zoning, get permission there, go back to the Historic Commission, get permission there, and all the I's and T's are dotted and crossed, and that brought us to today. Now the plaque is a simple little plaque and is done by Kyle Sign. We've already had one correction, and Chris called me and said, Mr. Miller, you misspelled my grandmother's name. <laughs> it's one L. And so Kent Kyle will have it fixed. There's Kent. We'll have it fixed and then we'll have it mounted very, very soon. So thank you very much. Um, there again, this is just an opportunity to capture history and to promote it and preserve it for the next generations. And it's not about us and it's not about a stucco. 1,200 square foot house at 413 Henry Clay Street. It's about a great family that lived here. So thank you. Sanda. Good afternoon, everybody. I wish you guys could see what I'm seeing right now because this is, this is beautiful. Um, when Carrie McGann and I started planning the community tapestry two years ago, we were wanting to as a historical society, we wanted to build our local black history collection and archive because we had just so little black history information. And as the only black member in the historical society, I was feeling lost because just because I'm black doesn't mean I know my history. And so that's what makes this even special today is that I'm just excited that Mike Miller took it upon himself to approach us about the Rab House because the Rabs did make great strides in this community. 
So when Mike approached us, he was like a little kid. He was so excited that he found out all this information. And I just kind of looked at him because I was aware of the rabs. I didn't know it was this house. So we invited him to the tapestry. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to come, but he did send the plaque and we displayed it and we talked about the Rab family. Just doing some research on Rab Sr., I didn't realize it, but he actually worked to against a segregated swimming pool here in Shelbyville, as well as the ice skating rink. So that was, you always just heard of him as, as being the physician that, you know, sat Mr. Marshall's leg, or Miss Maureen Ashby, she was his first girl. And that's about all I knew. So, you know, we hear about other black leaders, but didn't really know what Dr. Rabb did. So it was great that he at least started that, that movement to, to make the community a whole for all of us. Um, let's see, I'm not a public speaker, so I have something written, but I can't read it right now. Uh, the tapestry brought out a lot of a diverse group, and it's much like what we're seeing today. And it just shows that not only Rab Sr., the work that he did, but also Jewel Rab, because she was an educator. I don't know if she had any, if, if any of her students are out here, but she was not only an educator, up on the steps back there. That's great, that's great. Not only was she an educator, but she was a very talented math teacher. And that's very, very rare for women. So she too, she also made great strides. And of course we know about Rab Jr. I mean, what can we say? He was world renowned ophthalmologist. He also worked in sickle cell research. So I'm not gonna get into all that because Chris is here and he's gonna talk about the family history. But hopefully this is not the last of the local black history that we find out. It's always great when a private citizen comes to us with something that they wanna display and they're proud of because we're always there, we're always willing to listen. So thank you all for coming and I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Rand Paul. It's a great honor to be here today and to be part of this celebration. When I hear about the Rab family and I read more about Kentucky history, I'm really sometimes amazed at how many both good and bad things happened that Kentucky was in the middle of a lot of this. I think back to Berea College, first integrated college, integrated in 1850. State integrated all the way until our legislature did something horrible in 1905 and said it would be illegal for blacks and whites to go to school together. For 30 odd years, 40 years, we were integrated at Berea College. First college in America to do this, but then we make a law. But the interesting thing about the Rabb family is it goes from 1905 when Kentucky legislature says you cannot have integrated education, education all the way until either Maurice uh, Senior or Junior, but Chris will tell you more about that. But the Rabb family was instrumental in getting this day law overturned. I think about as I learn the history and I go to Louisville and we look for the house where William Morley lived. It's no longer there. William Morley founded the NAACP, was a lawyer in Louisville, and in 1914 sued over a housing segregation law. The legislature ruled that a white man couldn't sell a house to a black man and vice versa. He fought this case all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 1917 the Supreme Court unanimously overturned Louisville's housing segregation law. What fascinates me about this is a lot of people, maybe myself included, thought it started with the sit-ins in 1960. There were sit-ins in 1937 at the public library in Alexandria, Virginia. Civil rights didn't start in the 1960s, and I'm not preaching, I'm just saying, look, it's amazing to me that a lot of it was in Kentucky, but we're talking about 60 years before that, the struggle till we get to the culmination in the 60s. But I'm happy to be part of this today. In Louisville, we just opened an office recently, and we're calling it the William Morley Center. 
named after this great, uh, and I have to say it, Republican African American in Louisville who uh, helped found the NAAC and fought the first segregation kicks. That's as partisan as I'll get, sorry. But, uh, but we have, there's a proud history for Kentucky, and a lot bad and good happened, and I'm pleased to be part of a celebration to celebrate a family who I think helped a lot of good things happen for both our state and for the country. Thank you very much, and I give you uh, Chris Rapp. Good afternoon. This is my first time in Shelbyville. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And I'm here. I'm here because I had to be here. Because I wouldn't be where I was if it was not for Shelbyville. And if it weren't for my ancestors who were committed to justice at any cost. And one of those costs was bringing a child into the world who had to face Jim Crow and white supremacy by law. They made my father, Maurice Jr., the poster child. He could do no wrong, even if he wanted to. He had to be, he had to act right privately and publicly. He had to be an outstanding student. He had to be an outstanding citizen. He had to do everything right and had to be under the microscope at all times. I'm very proud of my family. Their accomplishments were in spite of laws that prohibited any meaningful upward mobility of black people in this state. Senator Rand talked about, Senator Paul, excuse me, talked about some of these laws. These laws were specific, they were onerous, Every step of the way, my grandparents, their colleagues, their fellow neighbors, white and black, fought against them, despite all of the pressures against them. The things that we take for granted today, particularly my children's generation, are things that some of you experienced early on and realized that they were something that you fought for with blood, sweat, and tears. My grandparents were not the only ones. They were not the first, but they stood out because they did what they could. My grandfather was a healer. My grandmother was a teacher, and they were both activists. They were both activists. And they raised a son who did not want to be an activist. He wanted to be a photographer. His father said, you will be a doctor. And that's what he did. And that is why my father made sure my brother and I were not doctors. <laughs> and I thank him for that. <laughs> I just want to say that this event and the work that Mr. Miller has done to make this happen and all of you who supported him represents the best of America the best of America. We want to live in a country where everyone has the opportunity to flourish irrespective of their background. This is what we want. My father remembers his father, a physician and community leader, being talked down to by a teenage boy at a department store and having to hear his father being addressed as boy. There's a reason this is the first time I've been to Shelbyville. My father did not speak of it. It caused him too much pain. I learned more about my father's achievements as the first this and the first that at his memorial than growing up with him. It was too painful. But here today I stand in front of a diverse audience, old, young, white, black, 
Democrat, Republican. And I have a greater sense of hope. Because the things that my grandparents and my father fought for were considered radical. They were considered nonviolent militants for integration. That was a militant position back then. It is the norm. It is mainstream now. It is what is good and proper. It is what it should be expected in this country and in this state and in this town. And it is with that that I am glad to be here, surrounded by people who care about history, who do not seek to cover it, but put a light on it to determine how far we've come and how far we have yet to go, and to do so together. And so I thank you on behalf of all of my family, my brother Maurice III, my mother Madeline Murphy Rabb, my children and my niece Ella. Thank you all. It is truly an honor to be here. Thank you all. Pendleton has invited everyone to uh, come to the church and have a light refreshment. Uh, Reverend Marshall is going to close us with a testimonial and a prayer. So, and I think we can go forward even with the train. So, Rev, if, he's been here 55 years. One of the unique things that I will say to Mr. Rev here is that. Uh, one day while I was inside working, a gentleman came up the driveway and he started hollering, can I come in? Can I come in? And I said, the barbershop is open, it's a public place, yeah, come in. And when I went to the door, it was your father standing out there in the early 50 to 2000s. He had came home to Louisville and he decided to drive to Shelbyville to see if the place was still here. And I said, yeah, the place is still here. And if you go back in the back, you might find something that belongs to your daddy. <laughs> so with that, this has been a marvelous day. As you said, it's been long overdue, but I often heard it say it's better late than never. So here we are today celebrating the Rab family. Now for a correction and for the minutes, if anybody's keeping any, it wasn't a leg that was set, it was a nail that was taken out of my foot. And, and by the grace of God, it's the same foot that I'm limping on now. <laughs> so with that, we owe a deep amount of gratitude to the Rab family. Now, as I stand here, and as you stand here, it was also unique to see your father walk to that step and just look over Clay Street. I haven't seen this many folk on Clay Street in a long time, but we're here today. So with that, not keeping you long in the essence of the heat being here, we're gonna thank God for your presence today. I know you have busy schedules and I know that you took time out to be here. So with that, we're gonna close out with prayer. And as it was, you are invited to go across the street and have refreshments after the day is over. Now, I'm sitting here, I could find some folks that could tell you a whole lot about the Brad family. And one is Attorney Fleming sitting across the street. And then his sister, Mrs. Frances Marshall sitting across the street. I didn't tell you a whole lot about this family. But as we gather and close out today, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Chris, Mike, and Betsy, all of you all. Thank you all for coming today. Now, as I close out, I'm gonna share this with you with humor. Before you all leave today, I'm gonna put a box down there at the end of my sign, and I want all of y'all to put a doll in it before you leave. Let us pray. Eternal God, and you are eternal. We thank you. Oh God, I hope. Oh God, I hope. And you are hope. In ages past and I have been years to come. We thank you and we great we pray that you would grant unto us this day the job holding these fine people in our fine memories. For the contributions that they made not only to this community, but to the community that is beyond us. Thank you, Lord, for giving them the energy, giving them the strength, giving them the wisdom and the knowledge, even under difficult situations, because we know that they were under some difficult situations. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we had in getting to know them in the essence of that which I find so interesting today, to say today, the contributions that they made to the school 
where many of us went in the light of the school called Lincoln Institute. Thank you, Lord, for the folks that have traveled many miles to be here today, for all that will be said in the light of the future. And with that, we lift up the heartfelt prayer and heartfelt thanks to you, for it is in the name of Jesus Christ. And I mean it's in the name of Jesus Christ you allowed us to come together for such a marvelous celebration. And all of the people that have assembled under this humid day said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.